This is the home of the United Fish Agency's Fresh Fish Auction, and the final stop for the boats of Hawaii's commercial fishing fleet. It's the only fish auction of its kind between Tokyo and the eastern seaboard of the United States. And the tuna, swordfish, and other pelagic species brought to market here from the surrounding waters are world-renowned for their quality and freshness. It's here on the auction floor, day after day, that fish buyers, representing domestic and international markets, aggressively bid on some of the ocean's most valuable and sought-after catch. One by one, these fish are wild-caught, brought to market, and then distributed across supply lines that end up on the dinner plates of restaurants and households across the continents. When the auction bell rings at the crack of dawn, it's hard to escape the feeling that something big and important is taking place that goes well beyond the livelihoods of those working within the fishing community. After all, nearly 50% of the world's population relies on the ocean as its primary source of protein. Behind each of these fish, there is a story. A story that the average consumer rarely, if ever, has an opportunity to fully experience and appreciate. We can begin to grasp it by watching the action unfold on the auction floor. We can see how it ends up in the seafood sections of our favorite supermarkets. But in order to truly understand this story in its entirety, we must look to the high seas where it all begins and see for ourselves, from the perspective of the fishermen, whose courage and sacrifice make this all possible. Meet Captain Wang Gia An. He is Hawaii's first Vietnamese swordfish captain and has been fishing for tuna and swordfish in these waters since 1989. His boat, the Jackson T, is one of the biggest and best equipped in the Hawaii fleet. And as if that wasn't enough, he is also a renowned songwriter and poet, with thousands of fans around the world following on his website, which as of production boasts nearly three million hits. Wang is a larger than life character and I knew he'd be the perfect captain to help me understand and experience the sights, sounds, and adventure of a Hawaii longline fishing trip. In late March, I caught up with Wong at Saigon Pho in Honolulu to talk fishing over a bowl of Chinatown's finest noodle soup. Wong told me that he would be delighted to have me as a guest on an upcoming swordfish trip, and after a thorough briefing on fishing boat safety and a crash course on life at sea, we made plans to embark on an unforgettable journey together. My goal was simple, to experience the seldom seen aspects of the Hawaii fishing industry firsthand, to learn where the fish of the Hawaii fish auction come from, how they are caught, and to personally meet the unsung heroes operating behind the scenes of this high energy industry. Little did I know at the time that I would never again look at the fish section of a market or the menu of a seafood restaurant the same way again. The Jackson Tea leaves Honolulu for sword fishing grounds in the late morning of March 19th. The season is already well underway and in order to find the elusive fish this late in the game, Captain Wong decides to travel 500 miles to the northwest, where his plan is to intercept the fish as they move south to warmer waters. Wong has supplies to last for up to six weeks out at sea, and he's prepared to spend all of it in order to fill his boat. But after more than three decades of fishing, Wong knows that there are no guarantees in this business. A successful trip takes much more than just hard work and experience to pull off. To some extent, it comes down to sheer luck, and he's prepared for this as well. As his crew begin to prepare the boat for operation, Wong talks to a few of his fellow captains on the radio. There's a lot of water out here, and finding fish in the vast Pacific is not an easy task. 
By working together, Wong and his fellow fishermen stand a better chance at finding the proverbial needle in the haystack. Three days into the steam out to the grounds, a major problem is encountered, and I see for myself what Wong meant back in Honolulu when he told me that self-reliance, ingenuity, and the ability to improvise are the hallmarks of survival at sea. The boat has run over a cluster of free-floating marine debris in the early hours of the morning, and the large mass of discarded netting and abandoned fishing gear has fouled the boat's propeller, halting all progress towards the fishing grounds. Stranded hundreds of miles from land and unable to maneuver, the Jackson T is at the mercy of the ocean. The propeller must be freed, and in order to do that, someone will have to dive into the 65 degree water and cut away the debris. Only one man aboard possesses the skills and courage needed to complete this feat, and as the Jackson T's crew ready the compressed air tank and fasten the ladder to the stern, Deckhand Takoi of Kiribati dons his mask and wetsuit and prepares for his mission. What Takoi is preparing to do is extremely dangerous. Five foot seas and strong currents are just the beginnings of the hazards that Takoi now faces. The water is numbingly cold and one careless mistake could result in disaster for the fishing operation and serious bodily harm for Takoi. Carefully diving to avoid the crushing force of the boat's hull, Takoi latches himself to the propeller structure underwater and begins cutting with the knife tied to his wrist. He must work quickly in order to get as much debris freed as he can before being forced to come up. After 15 minutes of brain-freezing work under the boat, Takoi resurfaces. He is despondent from the cold and must warm himself in the boat's engine room for several minutes before he can even report on progress. The report is not optimistic. Debris remains tightly wound around the boat's shaft connecting the propeller to the engine and will require at least one more dive to fix. With the conditions worsening and the water as cold as it is, time is of the essence. Using my underwater camera equipment, however, Takoi, Captain Wong, and I are able to work together to formulate a strategy for removing what remains of the gear. As the boat continues to drift in the swells, Takoi gears up for what we all hope will be his final dive. Captain Wong and the entire crew hold their breath as Takoi disappears once more. No one is making money right now, and unless the problem is resolved, the trip will end early and unsuccessfully. The stakes are high, and everyone is counting on Takoi's abilities to get the Jackson T back on track. The boat's transmission is not designed to operate with rope tied around the shaft and propeller, so nothing can remain. With the debris cut away, Takoi signals to the crew above, who pull it to the surface. When he finally comes up from below, there is a collective sigh of relief, as Takoi indicates he has been successful in removing the debris. This incident could have doomed the entire trip, but through hard work and resourcefulness, not to mention tremendous courage on the part of Takoi, the Jackson T is once again on its way to the grounds and back in a position to catch fish. This incident has been a reminder that out at sea, these fishermen have no one to rely on but themselves and that failure to deal with the challenges they face can have disastrous consequences. For me, this has been a harrowing experience, but for Captain Wong and his crew, it's just another day at the office. A longline fishing operation is a beautifully simple yet highly efficient setup. Gear is put in the water just after sunset, starting with a heavy radio buoy attached to the 4mm monofilament mainline. As the boat travels, the line is rolled off the spool and the fishermen regularly snap smaller branch lines as it goes out. 
Each branch line ends with a large hook baited with a mackerel fish. Fluorescent light sticks are periodically tied on these lines as well to attract fish in the dark of night. It takes several hours for the 40 miles to be set and when it's all done, the fishermen grab a few hours of sleep before they begin the haul and see what fish have found their way onto the hooks. It's just after 5 a.m. on March 29th, and Captain Wong and his crew have reached the fishing grounds, set their gear, and are about to begin the first haul of the trip. The gear has been soaking for several hours now, and as the crew suit up for the day's work, a single thought occupies their minds. Will the 40 miles of area covered by last night's set yield fish, or will the Jackson T have to look elsewhere for the means to fill their hold? As the sun begins to rise, the radio buoy is brought aboard, the main line is tied to the spool, and the haul is officially underway. I can barely contain my excitement as the first leaders are retrieved from the main line and coiled into the hook boxes. It's just a matter of time before one of these hooks comes to the surface with a big fish on it. The weather is nice and the crew is settling into a routine, working together to efficiently bring hooks in, coil the branch lines and buoys, and run the boat. Deckhands Day and Chin are working the roller this morning, which means it will be they who first determine that a fish is on. About an hour into the haul, the main line gets tight and the action begins to heat up. Chin slows the boat down as a branch line bearing the weight of a large fish approaches the roller block. Day skillfully unsnaps this leader from the main line and almost simultaneously attaches it to a 30 meter fight line that the crew will use to bring the fish to the boat by hand. A large swordfish is far more powerful than any one of these fishermen alone. So rather than try to overcome the fish by aggressively pulling on the line, they skillfully give and take slack according to the fish's movements. Day and Chin can tell immediately that they are dealing with a large fish, and the whole crew springs to action in order to land it. At this point, the fight has just begun, and if they want to avoid losing the first big catch, they must work together quickly and skillfully. Chin maneuvers the boat while Day and the crew continue to fight the fish from the port side. The fish is thrashing and diving below the surface in a final attempt to free itself. When it finally breaks the surface, the crew quickly secure it with well-placed gaffs to the head and bill area. It's time to exercise some brute strength as the fish is hoisted out of the water and onto the deck. The Jackson T has landed its first fish of the trip, and it's a large sword, just what they're looking for. With the sword on deck, the work is just beginning now. As Takoi sets to work cleaning and dressing the catch, the rest of the crew untangle the gear and get right back to hauling. If they're lucky, they will repeat this process several more times before day's end. As the afternoon comes to a close, Captain Wong is pleased to have caught 20 